Gotchas, 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 chatting with Matt the Bat! You chat, I chat, we chat, I chat, chatting with Matt the Bat! Yeah! Hello, hello, hello everybody, and welcome back to yet another episode of Matt the Bat's Batchet Shit Show. I'm your host, Matt the Bat, and this... This is Bat Chats. It's an interview series where I interview my favorite creators, hear their unique perspectives, and just have a good goddamn time. Hallelujah. By the way, if you're new here, make sure to toss me a like, hit that subscribe button, and absolutely smash the living shit at that little bell notification. Ding! That way you can stay up to date on all the upcoming episodes. It takes two seconds, and it will put a smile on my cute little bat face. And speaking of cute, we have one of the cutest dudes I know on the show today, and I am so excited. Today we have one of my best friends on earth, Brendan Dyer of Millie, um, he's the front man of one of my favorite bands. I'm wearing their shirt, you can't tell right now, but uh, yeah, they're amazing. He's a, a Connecticut legend, gone Hollywood, but I still love him anyway. Everybody, please give a warm round of applause to Brendan Dyer of Millie. Woo! <laughs> thanks, thanks. What's up, Matt. man? What's Surf's up, up bro. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thanks for having me. Yeah, of course, man. How's that that LA sun, brah? It's great. It's uh, it's finally starting to feel a lot more like fall here. Don't act like you have seasons, bro. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> true. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, man. I'm I'm super happy to have you on. This is uh, long overdue, and it's really cool. I was we were talking about this before we came on, but it's pretty awesome that like I already know you. So a lot of what we're talking about is just shit that I'm very passionate about, and it's not like. I don't have to really do any research. Like I just know you, and I'm a huge fan of you and your music. So it's it's pretty uh, it's pretty unique interview, I would say. No, definitely. I mean, I figured uh, this would be kind of like a walk down memory lane, in like a lot of ways. Of course, man. Yeah, definitely. And uh, so for those who don't know, Brendan's an awesome band. Um, he moved out to LA. What, like three years ago now? Maybe longer. Yeah, coming up on four years. So how what was that transition like? Because you started in Connecticut. That's where we met back in 2011 I believe and then you moved to new you moved to Brooklyn at some point and mm-hmm. then I was seeing you there because we were both living in Brooklyn at the same time and then you moved to LA like what what has that been like that transition and what were the differences between where you were because I imagine like having space in LA and having a house is like pretty fucking awesome compared to the little apartment you were in, in in Brooklyn right I think just the natural uh thing that happens to people in Connecticut is you usually end up in New York or Boston, um, typically, if if you don't, you know, choose to stay in Connecticut. So I just tried the New York thing, but I really didn't like it. I mean, I love New York, but um, I could talk about all the cliches as to why it wasn't like right for me. Uh, but yeah, so I, I I had visited LA one time on tour, like prior to moving here, and I and I liked it in the short amount of time that I was here. But never imagined myself living here. Um, it wasn't until I visited on a vacation and uh, realized I really did like it. And I was just kind of in the right uh, place to make a transition and be able to move here. And, you know, obviously I've been here for like three and a half years now. So I feel like over time, it's like anything, even like if you go to college or, or move anywhere, it's like I feel like, you know, you start off hanging out with like a set group of people and then you kind of like weed through those people and find yeah your best friends and stuff and you know sitting here now i i feel like i've really fallen into like a good place we'll talk about this later but the la music scene is in a lot of ways like the connecticut music scene just in the sense of like like like-minded people gathering together making sick stuff um and we'll talk about that later but i remember when you were in the when you were in brooklyn you were kind of miserable like i remember visiting you at whole foods you were working there at the time and you were kind of bummed out and like i know i know that look in someone's eyes when they're in new york and they don't want to be there because i have felt that way and i lived there for seven years and like most of my friends have felt like that at some point and it is like a hard place to live right like it's if you don't like i've been there with no money and it fucking sucks i've been there like not knowing what I'm going to do with my life. And it f-ing sucks. It's a tough place to be, you know? It's like the city will really get you down. Like if you're down, it'll it'll just contribute totally. to that. It's kind of hard to uh, pick yourself up there. In, in my experience, and a lot of what you're saying is so true. It's like, um, dude, I wasn't, <laughs> wasn't showering when I lived there. I thought about this recently. <laughs> Nobody showers there, bro. It's part of the Dude, culture. I would go I would go like five or six days without taking a shower when I lived there. And I really don't know why I was doing that to myself. Like thinking back on it, I really don't understand why. Other than I can just say it's kind of 
or at least the lifestyle is living there. It's just very like, um, you know, burning the candle. Like the, there's no uh, burning the midnight candle. What do they say? You know what I mean? It's just very yeah, like, yeah. go, 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 go all the time. No, yeah. People are just used to living in constant uh, extremes. Like the weather is extreme. Their work-life balance is like pretty bad. So that's extreme. Uh, getting to one place to another is really hard. That's extreme. And I feel like a lot of New Yorkers kind of adapt to living in misery. And like, that's mm-hmm. what I felt like I started to do. And that's why I moved out uh, temporarily, just because it's just like, I need to have that break from it. Um, but, I mean, you know, there's a lot of great things about New York and like it has a great music scene, but like you can experience that when you tour and stuff. And like, I remember having seen you in Brooklyn and other places uh, throughout the years, Webster Hall, one time I saw you play and like, it's been cool. It was kind of cool to see you come into the city. That was before you were living here and just like, hit all these spots that I liked, like Trans Pecos and, or Picos, I don't know how to say it, um, and Ridgewood, where it's just like, you'd get in there and it would just feel like that scene that I, you know, that we grew up in, in Connecticut. It's kind of cool. That's sweet. Thanks for saying that. You know, my favorite New York story with you, I don't even know if you, I mean, I'm sure you remember it, but you wouldn't even think about it probably. Uh, do you remember a little thing called CMJ? Yeah, of course, yeah. Yeah, so in like 2014 or 2015, you, Sean, and I, went to go see Laced, which was Beach Fossil's side project band. And it was somewhere deep as hell in Bushwick. And back then I had never, I think I was living in Fida at the time. I was still in the dorms. Must've been like 18 or 19. And we took a train, we took the J train out and we saw them play and it was like pretty awesome. And we had a great time. And we're walking out to go back to the train. And as we're walking, who do we see? We see Mac DeMarco. And he's peeing in the street <laughs> and he's like pissing on like a car in the street. And we're like whispering like, oh, that's Mac DeMarco. Cause we, we had seen him in the venue. Right. So we knew he was around, uh, him and his girlfriend were there and they're absolutely drunk as hell and just having a great time. <laughs> and somehow he made his way outside by himself and was kind of like lost in like the alley of, of Bushwick. And we saw him and it was just such a funny thing. Like it was kind of when I saw, I was like, oh wow, this, this New York scene is pretty fucking awesome. And like a lot of the people that I love go there and Mac was living in Brooklyn at the time. So like he was seen often at, at parties and different things like that. But uh, that was just a fun memory. Do you remember that? Uh, yeah, I do. And I remember it too, just because, I mean, that was 2014 and he was kind of, uh, he was kind of on top of the world at that point in terms of like indie stardom, you know, I think his uh, salad days record came out earlier that year. And that was the year we both graduated high school too. Like we, cause you were pro, you're a freshman in college. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that was, that was very like, uh, you know, I mean, you had already been in the city, but I hadn't. And it was very like suburban kid goes into the big city and sees like an icon at like a show or something. That, that was very cool at the time. Definitely. Yeah, man. We used to idolize a lot of those indie bands. I mean, I still do in a lot of ways. Like I, if I see someone like Dustin from Beach Fossils, I'm just like, holy shit. Cause I still, all that music had such a, a big, like formative part of my life. Like the formative years of me kind of growing up and like leaving the small town in Connecticut was just like listening to a lot of those bands. And, you know, like I knew Dustin had moved to New York with nothing. And he was really, uh, that was really cool to me to see. And I was really inspired by that. So like seeing like those kind of people do their thing was just, was awesome and it helped push me kind of out of Connecticut which I'm sure is the same for you right oh yeah no 100% and like yeah no I mean Beach Fossils (laughs) was really a a formative band for both of us I would say just just in high school like and you know it was cool with bands like that too because they weren't afraid to talk about things that influenced them and I feel like in turn um, at least for me, it put me onto a lot of music I wasn't familiar with. For you, what was your evolution of being a listener? Because like, I'm assuming that our our, our listening record is is kind of similar in the sense. I think we both started out listening to classic rock, and then you know whatever our dad was listening to, which is probably like 70s music, and then it kind of went into listening to like, oh, I can find my own bands that are cool right now, like a lot of pop punk or looking back on some 90s punk and stuff like that, and then it kind of transitioned to the more mellow stuff like listening to real estate and King Cruel and Beach Fossils and all that kind of stuff, and then now I feel like you found such such a perfect niche for you and your music. So what was that like? What was your uh, trajectory kind of in that into where you are now and like the music you're making? Well, I think you and I kind of were 
like because we're the same age and i we had the same interest one day apart baby yeah one day apart so i (laughs) i feel like we um i mean i'll just say it's like you know it was up until i was 14 it was you know beatles world and you know everything that (laughs) falls into that sort of 60s thing um and you know as funny as it sounds it wasn't until i found uh the velvet underground truly were kind of my gateway into getting an interest into like kind of what other music there was to offer because it was so uh abstract i guess for lack of a better word but it still was like okay this is like 60s music you know um but yeah no funny enough i was i was a freshman in high school and it was um I would I would credit skate videos probably. I, I yeah, think Yeah, for sure. MGMT, that's where I heard about MGMT. MGMT was a big band for me and like, you know, we we obviously always uh had a thing for Green Day and like still do even mm-hmm. as I get older. I feel like I really appreciate them, but um I was a freshman in high school and I got into, you know, Toro y Moi. Yeah. Yeah, it was Toro y Moi that was truly the gateway for me it was uh, cuz my freshman year of high school it was like that and like that was when i started to uh you know play we had a, i was a freshman in high school and we had our first basement show at my parents house um sick and <laughs> it, and if you remember how those were it was like you know we would have all these different bands come through so suddenly i was very uh intrigued by the music that was being made locally and in, in in turn, you know, was put onto a lot of music through those local bands. But, you know, also, but what I was saying was like Toro y Ma was kind of my gateway to like uh, indie as it was at the time. I guess that's considered chill wave. But through that, I found um, real estate and, and girls and all those beach fossils dive. It all kind of like hell yeah, deer hunter, that nice little canon of like 2010s uh waves best coast you know we we were seeing a lot of cool shows in connecticut because a lot of those bands would come through you know for you and i it was cool because bands like cloud nothings or uh speedy ortiz or surfer blood or uh you know like bands like that would come through and king cruel like that was really special like we were lucky yeah as to be around because you know that was like a time when it was it was hard to be like get in the car and go to new york and see a show so anytime those bands came there we were super grateful but i do feel like on the diy level there's been sort of this shift for what people want there i guess that's kind of how i at least see it when i talk about the connecticut scene it is so insane to try to explain to people because you think about connecticut and it's such a place that seems like it lacks any cool culture and then you see that they actually have these really amazing pockets of great music and great food and all this kind of stuff. So I have like a lot of appreciation for that. And I can imagine as much as it was for me growing up in a small town and being the kid who loved music and nobody liked the music that you're listening to, it must have been kind of tough to be that kid in your high school who was like, you know, dressing a little different than everybody, listening to music that nobody even had even heard of. And I remember a story that you told me once and your old band, The Ferns. The established group that we all come to know and love. The Ferns! Uh, I remember a story that I think somebody like in your class, like you were in computer lab and he played your song in the class and just mortified you in front of like the whole class, right? And that's the type of shit that I would deal with there too. But it's so funny. It's like that meme where it's like that guy, the guys at the party and he's like, they have no clue that I, whatever. And like this meme is like, they have no clue that I'm fucking running the scene in Connecticut. And I'm like, a hot shot there and people love my music and like you do you become like a little like almost like a little star in that mm-hmm. scene once once you start to gain traction and like you guys always made amazing music so you were in that position where like people were like really loving what you were doing so do you think it was difficult like being in that position in Connecticut and just being a little bit different it, there was a point I, it was the uh it was the end of my freshman year of high school and I kind of just came to this agreement with myself I remember where I was just like this is going to sound a little ridiculous, but just follow me. I was, I was genuinely like, I've, I've found myself. Like, I know what I like. I know what I want to do. And I know a lot of the people around me in, in my classes haven't figured that out. There's a lot of, right. you know, 
I mean, dude, I'm sure you don't like get called gay, yeah. just like stupid shit yeah, like that. And course. I'm just like, all right, like you're trying to figure out like your whole masculinity thing. And like, you know what I mean? I just kind of like threw in the towel and I was kind of like, I don't care. Like, I, I really don't. Like I have, I might have like less friends outside of school, but those friends like the same shit that I do. It was coinciding with the time that I started to go to like, uh, DIY shows in Connecticut that it was like such a breath of fresh air to just be able to be around like like-minded people you know like people who just like probably were in the same position where it was like and, and you know in hindsight it's just funny because it's like dude what the f like who cares yeah, if I like who gives a shit who cares what music <laughs> I like or like that I don't want to play sports it's so cliche it's so you know I'm watching Freaks and Geeks right now rewatching yeah. it and <laughs> It's, I mean, it's accurate though right like it, in a it lot truly of ways is. <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean what's interesting about you too and and your old band was like you guys it was a band literally a band of brothers so it was you and your brother and then another set of brothers and what's so cool about that is i feel like from an early age because you guys started playing i think when you were in like elementary school right like sixth grade yeah <gasps> that's when the band began for me at least so that's crazy i mean but what that does, I think, for you is it teaches you uh, like a proper dynamic, like having literally your brothers in a band and having you guys all together. Uh, it just teaches like a really a really nice brotherhood aspect to like being in a group that has to be with each other through all, you know, through shitty times, through touring, through recording late nights. Like, I feel like it's really important that you have the, that dynamic. And I think from what I've seen, you've been able to find that within Millie. Would you agree with that? Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, Dude, just the trajectory. I mean, if, you know, Ferns, Ferns had so many lineups by the end of it. Um, but, you know, with all with all good rotations of good friends. But I feel like um, to me, there's just something so sacred about a band. Like if it if one person's throwing the vibe off, like I, I'm not even going to entertain it. You know what I mean? Like, I feel like uh, you got to be careful with that sort of thing for it to operate. I will say for being like young kids in a band, your music was always so good and ahead of its time. And it, it sounds crazy to say, but as from a perspective of me, who was in like definitely like the worst band in the scene, I would look up to you guys so much and I would be like, you guys were so sick. And like, we would go every weekend and we talked about this a little bit before, but like literally like every weekend there is another show going on and it was different basements and we'd have all these different bands and record labels and we were all kind of a part of that and for me it was really sweet to watch you transition from being somebody who was in a smaller band who looked up to those bigger bands like high, like pie pop the guru to being like their friends and like mm -hmm. being within like a part of their their label and to me that was kind of like the first time i saw someone's work ethic as a musician firsthand and how it paid off and with that being said, you guys did so much of that stuff yourself. You recorded your albums, you threw the shows, you uh, you had merch and you made cassettes and stuff like that. Like that was crazy to do as like a young kid. And you were pretty much making this giant creator economy by yourself as a teenager. And I think that that is almost shocking to hear when you think about when, you know, being 25 and thinking about a kid who's 10 years younger than us doing that. Like. Think about what a 15 year old looks like to us right now. Like that's a young kid, you know? I appreciate you saying, I mean, I've never even thought about that perspective, but when you lay it out that way, it is kind of crazy. Cause I'm like, I mean, I don't know any 15 year olds now really. So I don't know what they're up <laughs> I'm to. I'm glad that might be a little yeah. fucking weird if you did. <laughs> like, oh yeah, uh, I got tons of 15 year old friends. Yeah. <laughs> hey, uh, for the record, we rode pretty hard for uh, Polaris Vibes. <laughs> we did. Yeah, I know we you did because you're you a good guys. friend. We uh, <laughs> we play shows with you. Like you want to say you're you weren't the best band in the scene, but I had a lot of fun. I even I played a set with you too. Remember? Yeah, I know. I played guitar. Thank you for doing that, man. It really upped my confidence level back in the day. I needed it. <laughs> yeah, so you come to LA and you get pretty connected to some people out there, and you actually get a record label deal at Dangerbird Records, which are an important label in terms of just like. The Silver Lake music scene and everything else that that's happened out there. What was that transition like from being such a homegrown, you know, do it do it yourself, literally DIY, to being part of a label? Was that like cool or was it kind of something you had to adjust to? They're pretty grassroots over there, so the transition was really easy. I mean, to give you to give you the the short of it, I mean, um, I feel like I kept the same. I've always kept the same sort of 
ethos with making music and um nothing changed when that happened i mean basically i moved out here and i recorded two songs my first two songs uh literally with this dude that i got ho got hooked up with like in his bedroom at his parents house i did all the instruments on it had my friend Corey mix it and i just put him up on Bandcamp, and i really and this was in 2018 right when i moved here and i had this really specific sort of uh i guess how would you say this was this people are forever and crazy horse uh people are forever and millie okay yeah the first two songs i guess i'll use mission statement i had a or like i just had a personal philosophy that was kind of like um i know i want to do music i i don't want to rush anything and i just moved somewhere new so i'm really just gonna kind of hone in on you know really focusing on myself and getting a job and not really like allowing myself to rush into uh, the world of playing music and, and all that. So I really was patient. I didn't play any shows. I And by the time 2019 had rolled around, um, I I literally had played one, one singular show in LA. I played one singular show as Millie when I found like the right group of people. And then we played our second show in February of 2019. And then a month later, it's March. And I'm, I'm literally just hanging out uh, with my my girlfriend at the time, we're just hanging out, and I go on Instagram, and I'm looking at my DMs because someone DM me something, and then I see like you know like the request folder, so I click on it, and I get this request, and it says, "Hey, uh, my name's Jim, I'm an A and R at Danger Bird Records here in LA. I also play in Granddaddy and Modest Mouse, and I'm wow. imme I'm immediately like, okay, what the." F because those yeah, are both <laughs> really important bands to me. Um, of course. So, uh, and, and basically he says, like, I found your two songs. I'm just interested. He was kind of interested, like, what do you, are you working on anything right now? Uh, would you want to meet up? It let's just like hang out and talk. So of course I was like, and I, and I knew enough about their label. I met up with him and he was just really into what I was doing. Um, and they just kind of offered me this, this, they call it the microdose deal. It's like <laughs> I know, it's like two si two singles. So that was uh, the songs uh, "Crazy Horse" and, and "Talking Secret." And then from there, it just kind of snowballed. Like they got us on a U.S. tour opening for a band on the label, and we got a booking agent on that tour, and things got pretty real pretty quick. This is awesome, dude. I remember when I first heard "Talking Secret," like. I mean, I think you had sent me some demos for it, for it, but once I first like saw the video, I remember it being this crazy mind-blowing moment for me because I had seen a similar style throughout your years in Fern. So then when I when I saw you put this out and it was just like heavy and crunchy and it sounded just so fucking good. And the video too was like the best quality video I've ever seen you in, like in general. Like because you know, a lot of the stuff we would make in Connecticut would be like you know, home VHS tapes and stuff like mm -hmm. that. And we were, you know, everything was on film. Uh, so to see this like really produce, but still keep the value of being, you know, I, I hate to say it, but like lo-fi in a way was like really, really cool for me. And I think that a lot of artists are afraid to make that leap and that can be detrimental to a lot of them. Like, you know, I think I've seen it happen with Green Day a little bit. <laughs> um, which by the way, if anyone on here hasn't checked out my, my video, uh, I just ranked up all the albums from green day. And I talked about this a little bit in there. I checked it a out. Lot of, oh, thanks man. Appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> a lot to. of people like are afraid to change. So like, what do you, what do you say to people who are going to make that jump? You have to make stuff that you're happy with. Like you would, like you're doing your videos, you know what I mean? It's like, mm -hmm. yeah. um, I think at the core of it, I mean, this is maybe a shitty answer, but I'm not, I'm not like intentionally thinking of anything to be honest with you i think it's just um from years of experience and just like having some part of my brain that like understands like what i want my music to sound like um just kind of together it just kind of comes out i don't i don't really know i mean uh i don't put too much thought into it it just it comes naturally sometimes not to not to be uh <laughs> Not to be a dick, but sometimes I feel like it's either you have it or you don't in a way. Totally. You know, you know, if you have it or there's just like some sort of 
uh, confidence that comes with these things that you need to be able to tap into. And I feel like everyone does have that, but it's a matter of find, finding it, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's interesting you say that because it brought up something that I hadn't even thought about. And I think that there are two different sides of the spectrum. Like there's people like you who just like wake up every day and they love to make art. They love to make stuff like they live to create. Like literally you have been making music. You've been listening to music your entire life, but you've been making music forever at this point. Like you've been one of the people that I've seen stick to it more intensely than anybody I really know, uh, which is cool. So there's like people like you and then there's people like, and you know, I maybe this will bite me in the ass someday. I'm sure he's a fine person, but MGMK, bro. There's somebody who saw the vision they wanted but aren't necessarily authentic to that vision and it comes off as cheesy. So I do agree. It's like, it depends what your intentions are. And like, if you love music, you love music, try it out. And that's one of the things, and I talk about him in every episode. And like, that's one of the things I like about Post Malone is he just does it. Like he does whatever he wants and he does it pretty well. And that's where he is. And like, I think that there's something to that. People, people have their bullshit detector on most people. And <laughs> yeah. if you're not genuine in your approach, it, it's not gonna last, you know what I mean? You might you might pop up for a moment or you might have your uh, you know, couple of years of, of stardom or whatever, but I feel like the best stuff, it, it comes from the purest place in your soul, in your soul. Totally. Dude, I mean, I nothing gives me joy like me making music does. It, it, it's yeah. just the honest truth. And I really don't, I don't get that sort of feeling of like just feeling truly like myself and just like in my own sort of like uh what do you call it like ecosystem in my brain unless i'm doing that you know what i mean totally. and i feel like the best of the best not saying i'm the best of the best but like people like post malone or uh you know like for the most part like billy joe armstrong it's like that those are just people who like you know they they don't want to do anything else but that like it's truly what they feel like they should be doing every day totally yeah and i mean for me that's super inspiring to see and is the reason why i like push myself as well because like the, i mean the possibilities are endless right like if you strike gold that's great but like right now i'm not like i haven't banked on this show being anything gold like i've just banked on like fucking doing what i love to do because i wake up every morning and i want to make shit and I, I hope that pays off and I think it will and I think it will pay off for people who do it but like I agree like and I've had that mindset of just like going into it from the pure passion and like perfecting your craft rather than the outcome of it and I think that's what makes like the most genuine people you know so who are the bands that you think influence this particular like sound or genre um, like I, I hear a lot of Sonic Youth and a lot of the guitars which is awesome for me because I'm a big Sonic Youth fan so like a lot of like the tones and the guitars and stuff like that remind me of that. Um, but I don't know any bands that are doing it like you right now that have that really raw, authentic 90s sound. And you see that in a lot of your videos too. I mean, just kind of going down the list, like Denial really reminds me of like a 90s video and just the way it's shot. And it's like you being green screened in at that angle is super 90s. And then the animation itself is super cool and old school. Like, I guess you're pretty inspired by the 90s. It's is what I would guess and you know we've also talked about this before in person but like the Millie logo is super 90s and I know that you were inspired by Nickelodeon and kind of the splat format of it I don't know I guess the the easiest way to put it is I think that the the 90s had the best music in my opinion and and visual art and and TV it was just extremely influential and I like the campiness that a lot of um, you know those Nickelodeon cartoons had and in the visuals. And I feel like I think that the early 2000s transition into the mid 2000s still really grasped onto a lot of those concepts culturally and in TV and music and stuff Yeah, that it still had that spirit. But I think the reason, you know, I think there's just more, there's, Undeniably, there's a lot of star power in the 90s in music, like Kurt yeah. Cobain, uh, Smashing Pumpkins, yeah. uh, you know, uh, fucking, uh, like Alanis Morissette, like fucking, yeah. 
uh, I don't even care. Like N Sync, like Backstreet yeah. Boys, like Britney Spears. Like the list can just go fucking on. But you know, if if the top people of that time are embodying star power, it's not too far off to say that a lot of these like slept on '90s bands are also kind of you know following suit you know i just feel like there is a lot of like special things going on and people weren't too afraid to experiment and i feel like they really you know laid out the template and it's cool because i feel like now in in 2021 i feel like a lot of those groups that you know were, were putting records out in the mid 90s and their flops now they're like getting so much acclaim and yeah. they were so ahead of their time. Same thing with like a lot of movies from that era or TV shows, you know? It's always interesting to see what bands are on t-shirts at fucking Walmart, right? Because it's like grunge was like a weird sound for a lot of people. And I'm sure that a lot of since the 90s were a big boy band centric place, I'm sure like the majority of people didn't fuck with Nirvana. And if a band like Nirvana came out today, people wouldn't. I mean, there'd be it would have its audience, I think. But there wouldn't be like the massive sensation that's surrounded by Kurt Cobain and his death and all the right. things that factor in. Same thing with Sublime, I think. Like, since the the idea of how these bands went out is so uh, like fetishized, uh, for for lack of a better word, I think that obviously that's pushed them to be so much bigger than they they felt at the time. Like, obviously they had their their fame and their shine, but like. Truly, I think people like us saw them as like the rock and roll legends because that's how they are marketed to us, you know, which is really mm -hmm. interesting. It, again, it's like what I was saying earlier. It's like I don't even necessarily feel like I'm consciously referencing these things as much as I just like them. And they've, you know, had such an impact on me that that's just kind of how I, too, you know, want to create art or have ourselves like visually represented you know what are some bands you've been listening to that are current like who like i mean i know you love waveform just like i do uh i was actually wearing my waveform shirt before i put on the millie shirt that i'm wearing underneath my my matt the bat outfit um but i switched it out for you to not offend you uh even though i know those are your close friends but i should get them on the show sometime i don't know if they would do it but uh <laughs> that would be cool to talk with them they're they're cool like who are some other people that are kind of in your scene that you would compare to you guys or like say like oh you really appreciate them and what they're what they're working on right now uh there's this band called julie uh from i guess they're from like orange county and i kind of just got into them they have like an ep out but um i i had known kind of about them for a few years they're they're a bit younger than we are i i think they're like a couple of them are like 18 they're, they're like younger kids oh, shit. And it really, uh, it gave me kind of that wow, that like wow feeling when I, when I finally listened to their music. The same feeling, you know, that Waveform gave me when I found them early on. I mean, Dan may have just graduated high school when I found them or they were both still in high school. It was something like Nuts. that. And it was just sort of this like wow moment of like, I really, I want to befriend you because this is special, you know, and this, this band oh, yeah. Julie out here, I would say it's, it had that same sort of effect on me when I finally listened to their music and, 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 you know, I, they're pulling from similar influences as we are. I'm sure it, at least that's my interpretation through listening to their music. I really like that band. It's really cool because I don't know that being like a YouTuber now, I guess uh, what you would call it, like we're so a lot of YouTubers that I know and I network with are so wrapped up in the idea of like viralness. And so a lot of ways you're conditioned, like I feel conditioned to think that way. But then I see people with these, you know, small but mighty audiences like Millie's, like waveforms. And it's it's really interesting because you have like really like aggressively diehard fans that are listening to your music every day and have like an emotional connection with it. And the thing that I love about that is that you can actually see these people because you tour and you you get to see their faces. For me, like, you know, I might get a couple thousand vi video views and I have no clue who's watching them. I have, like, it's totally in the dark. It's just a number on the computer. And that sucks sometimes because I remember that feeling of people coming out to see you and there's nothing like being with your friends and like giving back. They're coming to support you and you're giving back to them. So I think it's just cool to see these audiences and how, how strong they are. I think that's the way to build and grow, especially as a musician is just, find your audience 
and then your audience tells their friends like you just told me about Julie and that's that becomes your life and that becomes your legacy and I think that that's like something really cool that I miss about music you know dude I will take a show of 30 people who give a fuck over like opening a show for a band that sold it out and no one cares to watch us play. And you're playing another show at the Troubadour, right? Like in the next couple of weeks on the 29th? Yeah, on the 29th. Nice. Are you pumped for that? I'm extremely pumped for that. Cause Dude, legendary venue. It's Holy le- shit. it's a legendary venue and yeah, I'm 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 over the moon about it. I mean that venue obviously is a a rock staple. So it's cool to <laughs> get to play on that stage, you know? Seriously, man. I mean, so many amazing people have played on that stage. It's like kind of an honor to be playing on there, honestly. And like, I know I'm, I'm just excited for you. Like, I think there's a lot, like you're recording an album. Are you allowed to talk about that at all? Like, yeah, we, we yeah. finished, we finished it. So I can, oh, I can talk no about way. it. Oh, no way. Yeah. Cool. You're going to, you're going to leak it to me? <laughs> I, I'll i leak it to you. Yeah. Oh, a- anything yeah, for you. <laughs> and by the way, just to say, like, like Millie already has a couple, you know, some releases out, two EPs, I, I guess you would call them, right? So I think it's like, what, like nine or ten songs total. So like, and they're all bangers. Like literally everyone holds such a specific place in my heart. And they also have a lot of great videos too. And they're, you know, it's cool. It's kind, of, it's like, you know, not to go off track, but it's really cool seeing you in that LA video scene because I see you're like with all these like dope LA filmmakers and just making amazing shit and like including as i said earlier like animation in your videos so i think everybody on here should go check that out because uh those are f-ing awesome but now you have an album coming out it's awesome you're busy trying to keep busy i mean we're not uh we're not by any means touring america yet again and i don't think that'll happen for quite some time but it it's it's good stuff on the horizon yeah we recorded our like debut album like lp it's 12 tracks we did it all of Ooh, august 12 12 songs 12 big boy songs that's hefty that's great one of, one of which is nine minutes long oh yeah. what is it jesus of suburbia yeah. <laughs> <laughs> cover yeah <laughs> well dude i'm i'm very very excited to hear this album uh do you have a potential release date yet no just like next summer next summer nice yeah man. Song of the summer. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on, my friend. Uh, This has been really cool. It's been such a walk down memory lane. I hope to have you on again soon. Maybe after you do your release, we can have you come back on and like, you know, I'll have listened to it at that point and we could talk about it and, you know, walk through it and kind of like more about the process and stuff. But hey, thanks for having me on. It was fun. I I would definitely do it again. Of course. Awesome. Yeah. Everybody listen to Millie. All the links will be in my bio below. They're on all streaming services and you can find their music videos, which I talked about earlier. I love them so much. They're all on YouTube. Um, Everybody, thank you for watching this episode of Bat Chats. Please make sure to like, maybe throw a comment in there, smash that subscribe button and absolutely destroy that little bell notification. That way you can stay up to date on all the upcoming episodes. Uh, Very exciting. When I hit 1K, I'm going to drop a new series that I think is probably the coolest thing to be seen on this channel yet. It's like something I'm super proud of. And uh, we're almost there. I think it's going to happen within the next month. So that's really awesome. Uh, As always, I'm Matt the Bat for Matt the Bat's Bat Shit Shit Show. So make sure to tune in next week or else. Bye. Or else. Yeah, buddy. Oh, my bad. I I would have done it. Can you take that or else? No, that was great. That was perfect, man. Love you, man. Thank you so much.